So I want to end with some applications of probability and some of the computational rules that evolve, are involved in figuring out probability in single and multiple probability topics. The credit, shall we? We're going to call this um, the game show host problem, all right? Ben, suppose you're on a game show and you are given a chance to choose from three different doors, all right? Now, behind one of the doors is a new car. Behind the other two, goats. Which door would you choose, Ben? Uh, door number one. Door number one. Ben chooses door number one. All right, now, the game show host, who, by the way, knows what's behind all the other doors, decides to open another door. Let's say he chooses door number three, behind which sits a goat. Now, Ben, game show host comes up to you and says, Ben, do you want to stay with door number one or go with door number two? Now, is it in your interest to switch your choice? Yeah. Well, wait. Remember, the host knows where the car is, so how do you know he's not playing a trick on you, trying to use reverse psychology to get you to pick a goat? Well, I, I wouldn't really care. I mean, my answer's based on statistics, based on variable change. Variable change? But he just asked you a simple question. Yeah, but you changed everything. Enlighten us. Well, when I was originally asked to choose a door, I had a 33.3% chance of choosing right. But after he opens one of the doors and then re-offers me the choice, it's now 66.7% if I choose to switch. So, yeah, I'll take door number two and thank you for the extra 33.3%. Exactly. People, remember, if you don't know which door to open, always account for variable change. Now, see, most people wouldn't take the switch out of paranoia, fear, emotions. But Mr. Campbell... He kept motions aside and let simple math get his ass into a brand new car. <laughs> Which is better than that goat you've been driving around campus. All right, everybody. <laughs> That's the end of the day. Thank you very much. You graded paper. So this actually gets at a really classic principle that was named after the game show host Monty Hall. This is called the Monty Hall problem. And there's actually been a lot of work done on this in statistics and mathematics. The basic idea is you're presented with three doors in this show, right? Let's call it, it's called Let's Make a Deal. You have three doors, and behind one door, there's this amazing red sports car. Behind the other two doors, they're goats, right? These things you don't want, right? Everyone would rather be in a sports car than on a goat. Uh, so the thing is, Monty Hall has you select one of the three doors. After the selection, he always goes to one of the doors you didn't select and eliminates it. Right, showing that the goat is, or the car is not behind that, and a goat is behind that door. So if you were to pick door number one or door number two, right, so say you pick door number one, he would go eliminate door number three, right? So this is the idea here that you now have two options left, door one and door two. And the question is, should you stick or should you switch? And it's actually been worked out that in this case, you should switch. It is the best long-term expectation approach, right? You're thinking here in this example, but the car's behind one, I now lose. And that's actually a fundamental problem that you are engaging in a bias of human thinking that you're not making the most informed probabilistic decision. And it's, it's really hard for us to, to make these decisions correctly. Um, it, it, it's for example, it's easy to say, oh, my uncle Joe smoked 40 years and never had lung cancer. So I'm not worried about smoking and lung cancer. Well, that's just that's just absurd. That's just a fundamental misconception about the nature of probability and risk. Um, it is not to say that you are guaranteed to get lung cancer because you smoke, but rather that the long-term expectation of smoking significantly increases the odds or risk of obtaining lung cancer. It's like a five-fold increase in your risk of lung cancer if you smoke. So there is a significant and causal, based on all kinds of interesting research done since the 1940s and 50s, classic Dolan Hill paper. Uh, there was a study where they randomly assigned the do dogs beagles to either be exposed to smoke or not and observe the increased risk of cancer causally in the experimental design. So there's been a lot of research over, you know, 70 some years looking at this to show that, well, yes, there is a link, but that's not to say that you're always going to have the outcome. And if you're expecting always to have some outcome, then you're just misunderstanding how to think about probability. And if you say, well, I'm just going to ignore probability because of that, you're actually going to make worse decisions. So to say, but in this case, I don't want to switch because look at the cars there. Okay. You, you know, you're right. You will lose sometimes using the switch strategy, but the principle is called concentration of probability. 
So if I have three doors and I select door number one, when I selected door number one, I had a one in three chance or 0.33 probability of selecting the correct door. However, after I make that selection, when the host eliminates another door, the two doors that I did not select inherently contained a 67% probability chance, right? Percent chance of having the car, right? So if I pick door number one, right? Not knowing what's behind these things. So we're back in this context, right? So if I pick door number one, there's a 33% chance it's there and there's a 67% chance it's not there, okay? So now if the host eliminates one of the other doors, all the probability that 67% has been concentrated into one of those two doors that were originally there. So now there's a 67% chance that the car is behind door number two, for example, if door number three was eliminated. And you might be like, I just don't understand how that works. It is the truth. Um, I can post some additional videos about the actual mathematical proofs that have been done to demonstrate this. But let me give you a broader example that makes you maybe ha perhaps realize how we can apply these kinds of things in real world if we can just learn to think straight about probability. So imagine instead of three doors that you are start out with 100 doors. So, okay, you got 100 doors. You pick door number one. Okay, so now you've picked door number one and you realize that there's a 1% chance that you pick correctly and a 99% chance you've picked incorrectly, right? That's the, those, that's the probability, right? Now the host say goes through systematically and eliminates all of the doors except one out of the 99 you did not select. So now there's your door and there's one door left. Can you realize, is it not pretty clear that you would be much better off to switch to the door that you did not originally select because it now contains 99% probability of having the correct, the, the desired outcome, right? That is the car. So these are ways that it can be really kind of hard for our brains to realize how to think straight about probability. We can get ourselves twisted up and confused, but learning some basic principles about probability can help us apply it better in real life and make good decisions. And that's what statistics is really all about. And again, it's about long-term expectations, right? So yes, you will lose sometimes, right? So, you know, if you have a 33% chance of having the car in the door you picked, then that means that there's a 33% chance you're going to lose by switching. But that doesn't mean that the best decision is not to switch. It is because 67% is better than 33%, right? Right. And that's life. You just don't know the truth. You can't. The truth is like, good luck. You're human. You don't know the truth. So what we have to do is get evidence and use probability to make the best decisions we can. All right. So important ideas in probability to understand are the ideas of independence and mutual exclusivity. In probability, independence is when two events, A and B, um, their occurrence has no effect on one another. So like if you think about flipping two coins, right? The, the result on one coin does not affect the result on the other coin because they are independent. So flipping and getting heads on one coin tells me nothing about what I should expect on the other coin, right? If I think it does, that's actually a problem in reasoning called the gambler's fallacy. So for example, a lot of people will go like flip coins and they'll be like, oh, I flipped four, four heads in a row, so I'm due for a tails. Well, the coin doesn't have a memory, right? So there are some interesting things about the patterns that can emerge in coin flips and which kinds of intervals are more likely to occur. But there is no reason for us to think, because it's not true, that a coin somehow owes us some occurrence next because every flip is independent, right? The first flip of the coin and the second flip of the coin are independent events. Given that, if I think that like, oh, I'm on a streak, right? Oh, a lot of people think that, right? Oh, I'm on a hot streak. I can't, I can't lose now. That's actually a fundamental flaw called the gambler's fallacy. You're not on a streak. In fact, there was this really interesting paper looking at athletes and the concept of, of streaks and having the hot hand in basketball. And what they found is that there wasn't actually evidence to support it. That it was just basically a, a, a confirmation bias of how they viewed things. Uh, so kind of some interesting things, although basketball is a much more complex thing than flipping a coin. So we won't pretend to deal with that in its full probabilistic fashion. But nonetheless, um, mutual exclusivity is another crucial concept to understand here. And that is that events are mutually exclusive if one occurring means the other cannot occur. So like you can't flip one coin 
and get heads and tails at the same time. They're mutually exclusive outcomes, right? So if you get heads, you cannot get tails. Those are mutually exclusive. So those are some important ideas that kind of form some baseline. And we'll come back to how these can be applied importantly um, moving on. So when we talk about probabilities, we, we talk about three different types a lot of times. In this class, we focus primarily on a simple probability issue. And that is just what's the probability of something, A, right, some event, A or E, whatever you want to call it. What is the probability of this thing? No other context, right? A conditional probability says what is the probability of event B given event A has occurred? So this now says, well, I have something I have to condition my thinking on, right? And this is actually very applicable, and we're going to talk about how it's applicable right now, especially in the context of things like diagnostics. So, for example, the question of whether or not, so say you get a positive test for some disease. Do you have the disease? And the answer is not necessarily. You have to do a lot more math to actually figure that out. The positive test is not proof of the disease. It's an indicator. It's what's called an analog, right? So the question really is, what is the probability that B, i.e. the disease exists, given that A, i.e. a positive test occurred. And in life, we often conflate analogs or measures with reality or truth, but they're not the same thing. What we have in life are measures, right? So how do we take these measures and get at what we actually want to know? How do I take test results in diagnostics and get at whether or not the disease is actually present? Because in case you don't realize this in the current context, no test is perfect. Not even very good tests are perfect, much less ones that are currently and still in development for certain things. So how is it that we deal with figuring out the probability of a disease given the results of some test when it is impossible to just get at the truth of whether the disease is present? We have to use the test and the test can't perform perfectly. It will have risks of false positives and false negatives as well as the possibility of true positives and true negatives. So your test actually has four possibilities, not just two. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Another type of probability is joint probability. And that asks about what are the probability of something like co-occurring with something else, right? So if I say, what's the probability that I win the lottery and my grandmother wins the lottery, right? We both win our state lotteries. Those are joint probabilities. And in case you don't realize from the example, when you have a joint probability, you're asking if you're asking two rare things to happen together, then the chances that they happen together is even more rare than how rare each one is independently. Does that make sense? So like you winning the lottery is rare. Your grandma winning the lottery is rare. You both winning the lottery is super rare, okay? So this is the idea of joint probability. And the way that we can get at these things is with some mathematical rules. The probability, a simple probability, is you just take the probability of the event over the probability of the event and its complements, right? Basically that whole idea of the event over the sample space. And we can get at that either with the classic calculations if the sample space is knowable and definable, or we can get at that with the frequentist calculations if they're unknowable and must be estimated. An additive probability applies when we're interested in things that are one thing or another thing, right? And so additive probabilities are about multiple events but about the, either of the events being acceptable. We don't want necessarily both events to co-occur. We want to have one of them occur. So for example, if you think about a raffle and they sell 200 raffle tickets, if you buy five tickets, you have additively increased your probability of winning, right? Because you went from having a one in 200 with one ticket to a five in 200 with five tickets. Because every ticket is mutually exclusive. If one of them is picked, they can't pick the other one. So assuming mutual exclusivity, right? They're not drawing multiple tickets. They're drawing one winner for the raffle, right? Then you having, being, being okay with any of your ticket being drawn, right? I'm okay if my first ticket is drawn or my second ticket is drawn. This symbol here is the idea of or, right? Versus and. This is inclusive. This is exclusive. So I'm okay with first ticket or second ticket or third ticket or fourth ticket or fifth ticket being drawn. I'm okay with any of that because they all mean I win. And so then I would use the additive rule and say that I have increased my odds in an additive fashion. The multiplicative rule back to, and down here I have like, you have to make adjustments if these events are not mutually exclusive and you have to make adjustments if these events are not independent. You don't have to worry about this math too much in our class. It's just like my little caveat disclaimer to like this math 
that I'm talking about the simple form is true so long as these conditions are met. If not, we have to make adjustments, right? We can't help but make some assumptions. So you just have to be clear about what your assumptions are. So here we're assuming mutual exclusivity. If that's not the case, we have to adjust for the non-exclusivity, right? Here we're assuming independence of events. If not, we have to adjust for the non-independence, okay? So don't worry about the math. Just know that it's my disclaimer uh, that I'm teaching the simple form, right? If you go higher up, I always say in education, every level of learning is just teaching you enough to go to the next level to find out why what you learned previously was not quite right. <laughs> so the multiplicative probability is the idea that if I want two events to co-occur, like you winning the lottery and grandma winning the lottery, notice those are independent events. Your winning the lottery does not affect your grandma winning the lottery. You're playing in different states. So if I get what's the probability of you winning the lottery in your state, what's the probability of grandma winning the lottery in her state? Those two things, I would multiply them. So if you had a one in a, bill, one in a million chance of winning the lottery, and so did grandma, your chances of both winning are one in a million times one in a million, which is a one in very, very big chance. Add all the zeros together, right? So, so one in 12 zeros chance of, right, of both of you winning. So notice it's much more unlikely for that to occur, to have two rare events can occur like that. So these types of rules are important uh, and knowing how to treat them is important in context like we're talking about decision making. So I mentioned diagnostics. So here's an example from back to my past. Some students mentioned liking sports. So here's an example about using steroid tests to figure out whether or not a player has done steroids. Notice a player doing steroids and getting a positive test are not the same thing. If you think they're the same thing, that is just incorrect. <laughs> it's just wrong. Um, and it's really easy for us to think that. It's easy to conflate those things, but they are not the same thing. Steroids tests are not perfect. No test is perfect. We have no perfect way to measure anything. So we do the best we can. We make as reliable and valid measures as we can make. And we use them to make the best inferences we can about the event we're actually interested in. So if I want to know if someone actually used steroids, I have to use a test to try to indicate it. So I don't actually know they use steroids from the test. I just know they got a positive result. So now I want to say, well, what's the probability that they did steroids given they had a positive result? So what I did is I went into the literature. This was back. This is a paper back at the end of the 1990s. So it's an older paper. I'm sure the, the tests have become more accurate, but it was a study done in mice to identify the accuracy of a test. So in this case, there's this nice thing with mice that they know whether or not they use steroids because the mice only do steroids if the people give it to them, right? <laughs> so you get mice in one cage, you give them steroids. Mice in the other cage, you don't give them steroids. You then test the mice urine to see which ones come up positive. And you can easily identify, okay, how many mice that we know didn't have steroids still tested positive? How many mice that we know did steroids actually tested positive, right? So in this study, the probability of getting a positive test result, result given, right, this is read given, given the mice were given steroids was only 0.76. That's 76%. So this is what we call a true positive rate. 76% true positive rate. That is, in mice who did steroids, 76% were correctly, truly identified as having done steroids. Okay? Then say that we want to know the false positive rate. So what's the probability of getting a positive test given the mice did not do steroids? Well, 13% of the mice who were not given steroids still had positive results in this paper. This is a paper by Perry et al. back in 1998. So I took these estimates just from the literature back when to do an example here, just teaching through how Bayes, right? This is the use of Bayes. So this is the one time I'm going to take you into Bayes because I think it's important to think about, even though it's not the focus of our course. So we're going to use Bayesian statistics to try to get at this probability and using conditional probability statements, okay? So I have these estimates, true positive rate, false positive rate. I take these rates, but I need to know one more thing before I can figure out what I want to know. I need to know what is the probability of steroids in my population? That is, what percentage of baseball players actually use steroids? If you don't know that or have an estimate of that, then it's very hard to get at this. So, and this is why Bayes says what we do is we use the best information we have, right? We take in our assumptions, we collect some data, we do the best we can, we get a posterior, and then we keep building, right? So if you get a new update on the, a better estimate of the steroid use in baseball, then you update it, right? I took this because I did some searching and I found estimates that range from five to 50%. I went a little conservative at the time and said 15%. Now we could update that if we get better, stronger estimates that are compelling, right? But so estimates range from five to 50% of major league baseball players use steroids. Um, 
And that's just from a quick search on the internet. So I'm not saying those numbers are true. I don't know. They're just the estimates that I found. It's really hard to find a study that actually has a good demonstration of this published in the literature. Um, so now what I want to know is what's the probability of A given B? And to calculate that, Bay says you get the probability of B given A multiplied by the probability of A over the probability of B. So how does that look here? Well, what I want to know, what is A? I want to know what is the probability someone actually did steroids given they tested positive, right? That's what I know. This is the given. They had a positive test. What I don't know, but I want to know is did they do steroids? To calculate this, Bayes simply says, what we do is we say, what is the probability of getting a positive test in steroid users? Okay, so we already identified. There's a 76% chance that people who use will be identified as users, okay? So then I have to take that and say, okay, well, what's the probability of being a steroid user in this population? Does that make sense? Because here, this basically is getting me the entire percentage of people who will be identified as users out of the users, right? So say that you have a sample that has 100 steroid users in it, and you test all 100 of them. You're only going to get positive tests on 76 of them. That's what this numerator is telling me, right? I can't say I'm going to get positive on all of them because I don't because I only have a 76 true positive rate. So out of my 100 steroid users, 70.76 of them are identified. That is 76 users are identified out of the actual users. Well, now I know how many users have been appropriately identified as users, but the question is how many positive tests am I going to get? And if I don't know the number of positive tests, then I can't finish this. So if I have, okay, I have this many positive tests. If I get the probability of a positive test, then I can take the probability of a positive test in steroid users and divide it by the probability of total positive tests to get the probability that a steroid user is identified via a positive test, right? So the way I can get a positive rate according to Bayes with conditional probabilities is I take the probability of a positive test given steroids multiplied by the probability of steroids, right? So that's this numerator right? That's how many true users are identified. So for example, 76 out of 100 true users are identified. So there's a point, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Here, what's the probability of a positive test not using steroids? This is a false positive right here, 0.13. And what's the probability of not using steroids, right? Well, we estimated 15% of baseball players use steroids in the population. So that means 85% of baseball players don't use steroids. You with me? So now what I need to know, how many how many people who are not users are identified as users compared to how many people who are users are identified as users? And so what we see is 76. So if we have our 100 people, right, 15 are going to be users, 85 are not going to be users. 76% of these 15 people are going to be called users. 13% of these non-users, 85 people, are going to be called users. So we're going to call a huge chunk of non-users users based on these the rates. Uh, if you actually do the math, you find out essentially that it's a 50-50. So say that we bust out a calculator to figure this out. So what we have in our numerator is positive given steroids times steroid probability. So we have 0.76 times 0.15. And so that is 0.114, okay? So let's remember that number, 0.114. Our denominator is 0.76 times 0.15 plus 0.13 times 0.85, right? So that if you, know, if you didn't just catch those numbers, we have 11 out of our 85 people that are going to be identified as users when they aren't. And we only have 11 of our 15 people who are correctly identified as users. So we have an equal number of users as non-users. So if we take these numbers, we had 0 0.1105, we add 0.114. That's our denominator. That's the probability of a positive test. We're going to get 22.5% positive tests, right? 0.225 is the probability of a positive test. So then I take 0.114 and divide it by 0.225. And I get 50.7. So the probability that a positive test actually means someone used steroids in this context with these estimates is only a 50.7%. It's like a coin flip, right? So this shows just how drastically it can be incorrect to assume that a test means the thing that you want to measure is actually present.
And in fact, in order to get at this, what we need to know is the risk of the thing in the population, and we need to know the true and false positive rates at a minimum. If we know those things, we can get at the probability that the thing is present given a positive test. So if you get tested for cancer and your doctor says it comes back positive, that does not mean you have cancer. In fact, you might, it might be more probable that you don't have cancer. Person Assuming you're just a randomly, randomly sampled person from the population, not pre-selected because of some risk, right? That changes things. But assuming you're randomly selected from the population, if the risk of cancer in the population is very low, like 3% for the given disease, even if the test is very accurate, it's actually going to probably come out more likely that you don't have cancer than that you do. Think about it this way. Say that there's a 1% chance risk of a disease. That means one out of 100 people actually have it, right? And say that you have a test that identifies correctly 99% of people with the disease. That means that you're most likely to identify that one person, right? However, say that it has a false positive rate of only 1%, right? That means you're equally likely to identify one of those 99 people who don't have it as having it, right? So that means it's a 50-50 that you actually have cancer if the risk of cancer is only 1%, even if the test has 99% true positive and 1% false positive rates, okay? So this is why it's really important and it's super applicable. You might say, I'm never gonna use this, but it's just not true. We see that this is very important in life, and if you don't use it, it's not because it's not useful, it's not because it's not applicable, it's simply because you've chosen not to apply knowledge that can be very beneficial to making decisions in life that are all based in probability, right? And so here's an interesting example about how, in fact, real life situations can be affected by incorrect application of probabilistic knowledge and thinking. Here's a more topical example of exactly the same thing. Those of you in Britain uh, will know about what's become rather a celebrated case of a woman called Sally Clark, who had two babies who died suddenly. And initially it was thought that they died of what's known informally as cot death and more formally as sudden infant death syndrome. For various reasons, she was later charged with murder. And at the trial, her trial, a very distinguished pediatrician gave evidence that the chance of two cot deaths innocent deaths in, in a family like hers, which was professional and non-smoking, was one in 73 million. Cut a long story short, uh, she was convicted at the time, later, fairly recently, acquitted on appeal, in fact on the second appeal, uh, and, and just to set it in context, you can imagine how awful it is for someone to have lost one child and then two, uh, if they're innocent, to be convicted of murdering them, to be put through the stress of the trial, convicted of murdering them, and to spend time in a women's prison where all the other prisoners think you killed your children. It's a really awful thing to happen to someone. And it happened in large part here because the expert got the statistics horribly wrong. In two different ways. So where did he get the one in 73 million number? He looked at some research which said the chance of one cot death in a family like uh, Sally Clark's is about one in eight and a half thousand. So he said, I'll assume that if you have one cot death in a family, the chance of a second child dying from cot death aren't changed. So that's what statisticians would call an assumption of independence. It's like saying if you toss a coin and get a head the first time, that won't affect the chance of getting a head the second time. So if we toss a coin, tw a coin twice, the chances of getting a head twice are a half, that's the chance the first time, times a half, the chance the second time. So he said here, let's assume, uh, I'll assume that these uh, events are independent, when you multiply eight and a half thousand together twice, you get about 73 million. And none of this was stated to the court as an assumption or presented to the jury that way. Unfortunately here, and really regrettably, first of all, in a situation like this, you'd have to verify it, it empirically. And secondly, it's palpably false. There are lots and lots of things that we don't know about sudden infant deaths. It might well be that there are environmental factors that we're not aware of, and it's pretty likely to be the case that there are genetic factors we're not aware of. So if a family suffer from one cot death, you'd put them in a high risk group. They've probably got these environmental risk factors and or genetic risk factors we don't know about. And to argue then that the chance of a second death is as if you didn't know that information is really silly. It's worse than silly, it's really bad science. Nonetheless, that's how it was presented and at trial, nobody even argued it. That's the first uh, problem. The second problem is what does the number of one in 73 million mean? So after Sally Clark was convicted, you can imagine it made rather uh, a splash in the press, one of the journalists from, from uh, 
Britain, one of Britain's more reputable newspapers, wrote that what the expert had said was the chance that she was innocent was one in 73 million. Now that's a logical error. It's exactly the same logical error as the logical error of thinking that after the disease test, which is 99% accurate, the chance of having the disease is 99%. In the disease example, we had to bear in mind two things, one of which was the possibility that the test got it right or not, and the other one was the chance a priori that the person had the disease or not. It's exactly the same in this context. There are two things involved, two parts to ex the explanation. We want to know how likely, or relatively how likely, two different explanations are. One of them is that Sally Clark was innocent, which is a priori overwhelmingly likely. Most mothers don't kill their children. And the second part of the explanation is that she suffered an incredibly unlikely event. Not as unlikely as one in 73 million, but nonetheless rather unlikely. The other explanation is that she was guilty. Now, that's, we, we probably think a priori that's unlikely, and we certainly should think in the context of a criminal trial that that's unlikely because of the presumption of innocence. And then, if she were trying to kill the children, she succeeded. So, the chance that she's innocent isn't one in 73 million. We don't know what it is. It has to do with weighing up the strength of the other evidence against her and the statistical evidence. We know the children died. What matters is how likely or unlikely relative to each other, the two explanations are, and they're both implausible. So there's a situation where errors in statistics had really profound and really unfortunate consequences. In fact, there are two other women who were convicted on the basis of the evidence of this paediatrician who have subsequently been released on appeal. Many cases were reviewed, and it's particularly topical because he's currently facing a disrepute charge at Britain's uh, General Medical Council. So, just so all this makes it clear that there is a pl applicability, probability is useful, and we will use probability in this class to make decisions, right? We use probability to make decision. What is the probability, right? We got to make a choice. And so we get some probability value and we have to decide what does that tell us. In statistics, mostly based off of Ronald Fisher, who we mentioned earlier, the value of 0 0.05, which means that there's a 1 in 20 chance of something happening, right? 0.05 or 5% is 1 in 20. If we get a p-value, a probability value, that is less than or equal to 0 0.05, we call this statistically significant, right? That is, we think it's a rare event in statistics. We think it must mean something, right? It's unlikely to happen simply by chance. And so when we make inferential decisions, which will move into inferential tests here in the near future, that p-value will be critical. Notice here that p-values getting closer to zero mean that something is less likely. P-values getting further from zero, closer to one, means something is more likely. So if we want something to be unlikely to think that it's meaningful, then we're saying 5% chance or less. So P must be less than or equal to 0 0.05 for us to call it statistically significant and therefore think that it means something, right? And what it means depends on the context from which the probability is derived. Okay, so this is hopefully useful. You realize a little more about probability. It will underlie a lot of the decision-making and thinking that we do in the rest of our class.